In this lesson, we're looking at gas exchange in complex organisms, so not plants right now. So there is our dot point, just one we're focusing on, and we'll move on to the other two in another lesson. So it's a small reminder that sometimes when we're discussing breathing, uh, you start to think about how you're breathing, and it starts to get a little shallow and off rhythm, so just be really mindful. Okay, so ventilation is the inhalation and exhalation of air from the outside world into our lungs. Now, we sometimes refer to it as respiration in, in everyday language, but that name's already taken in biology by cellular respiration, so I'm going to try and avoid using that term just to save some confusion. Now, gas exchange is occurring... Um, during ventilation in tiny little chambers inside the lungs called alveoli. And this is where oxygen and carbon dioxide diffuse along with their concentration gradient, right? So the intake of oxygen can be used for cellular respiration to produce energy, uh, which is a byproduct, sorry, which has a byproduct of CO2. And this is the gas exchange, right? Oxygen comes in, CO2 goes out. Now, oxygen has to enter the tissues, while CO2 must actually be removed from it, but it's these um, respiration processes that we're focusing on. Now, the anatomy of the respiratory system includes the mouth, the nose, the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles, and the lung alveoli. So essentially, it's one big tube going into the lungs and then out, but eventually it will branch off. So the mouth and nose, there's moisture and hair in there, so not in your mouth, in your nose, to trap dust and foreign material. Your trachea has cartilage rings around this to keep it open, as well as some smooth muscle. Uh, bronchi, they're the two main branches that branch off into the lungs, um, and they have smooth muscles in the walls so they can contract if need be. The bronchioles are then the smaller branches of the bronchi, and there's smooth muscles in those walls as well. Now your lungs, there's two of them, one on each side of your body, so we literally call them the left and right lungs, and they are filled with these tiny little air sacs called alveoli, which are little chambers where the gas exchange will occur with the tiny uh, capillaries. So there's muscles all the way through this system, and there's also a diaphragm which sits underneath your lungs, as well as uh, muscles in the ribs and the abdominals, and we'll talk more about them later. Now the lungs are really large and they take up a sizable chunk of the thorax, which is the area between your neck uh, and your abdomen. Essentially, it's your chest cavity. So the lungs are segmented into smaller sections known as lobes, and it allows them to be damaged or diseased or removed without completely compromising that entire side of the lung. The right lung has three lobes, while the left lung only has two, and this is because the heart is slightly left of center in the thorax, so that lung needs to compensate. Um, inside, they are filled with those tiny little air sacs, the little chambers where the gas exchange will occur. And that is happening in the alveoli. And these are like tiny little bunches of grape structures at the ends of the bronchioles, right? In Latin, alveolus actually means little cavity. So this is where the gas exchange is occurring via diffusion in and out of the capillaries running alongside the wall of the alveoli. Now, oxygen must diffuse through the thin walls in the cells in alveoli, so sorry, it's not thin wall, it's not thin cell walls, it's the thin wall of cells around them. So it's got to pass through the wall of the alveoli and into the capillary so that it can be picked up by the red blood cells and carried back to the heart and pumped around the body. Now, carbon dioxide does the reverse journey, it leaves the red blood cells and is diffused into the alveoli so it can be breathed out. So there's a huge number of these cham uh, chambers, means that you know, there's gas exchange surface area is really, really big. So if you compare it to, say, the inside of a balloon, which is just one big chamber versus hundreds and thousands of tiny little uh, gas chambers like these ones, you'll have more surface area. Now, the alveoli are made of two kinds of cells, and they're known as, as pneumocytes. So the prefix pneumo relates to the lungs, <coughs> excuse me, while the site part is a cell. So type 1 pneumocytes are these thin ones around the outside here, and they make up most of the wall of the alveoli. They are a single layer and they're flat and extremely thin. They are the ones that are running up against the capillary, which also has a really thin single layer of a cell. Uh, so the blood and the air in the alveoli space is only around 0.5 of a micrometer apart. So because this diffusion distance is really, really tiny, gas exchange can happen really, really fast because of the thin alveoli wall increases that rate of exchange. Now, the type 2 pneumocytes are these ones here. They are round and they only take up about 5% of the surface area of the alveoli that type 1s do. So they secrete a fluid and that fluid is known as surfactant. 
and that's really important for the function of the alveoli. The type 2 pneumocytes are secreting that surfactant all over the inside of that alveoli. So this moisture allows for the oxygen coming into the alveoli space to be dissolved and then diffused. Now CO2 can evaporate into the air when exchanged from the bloodstream with this fluid. So surfactant is the important addition to the moisture secreted by type 2 pneumocytes. It's not all surfactant. So it makes a monolayer on the surface uh, in the inner lining of the alveoli. It looks like a membrane layer, but it's there to decrease surface tension so that the water molecules don't all stick together. If they do stick together, the alveo alveoli will collapse like a deflated balloon. Now, these are microscopic images of alveoli, and you can see that it's mostly just empty space. Given that the alveoli space is literally just that, so there has to be room for air to come in from the bronchioles, and it has to be funneled somewhere, so it goes into these tiny little sacs. Premature babies actually have less surfactant and they're prone to collapsed lungs because of it. So if you look at the, um, the little microscopic images here, you can see in this second one with a collapsed alveoli, there's much less air space uh, to be able to breathe and therefore that gas exchange isn't really as efficient. Now the particle model in physics shows us if you decrease the volume for the same number of particles, the pressure is going to increase. Okay, that kind of makes sense. The same applies in the chest during gas exchange. So gas particles want to move where they're going to somewhere of lower pressure. And we've mentioned that in the thorax, the space is, you know, between your neck and your, your abs, essentially, your chest cavity. So when the pressure of the gases in the thorax, sorry, the, the pressure of the gases in the thorax rely on the movement of the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles between the ribs. And we'll talk more about that. The diaphragm sits directly underneath your lungs and it's its job to change the pressure inside the thorax and therefore in the lungs. And when the diaphragm contracts, it pulls down, which lowers the pressure in the lungs compared to the outside, meaning it draws air in. When the diaphragm relaxes, it relaxes upwards and the thorax space gets smaller, meaning the pressure gets higher and the air pushes out. Now, antagonistic muscles are those that work against one another and the intercostal muscles kind of work like this as well. There are internal and external intercostals, which assist in changing the shape of the rib cage, and they contribute to the change of pressure in the thorax. So muscles can only do work in one direction. So in this situation, you've got biceps and you've got triceps. One will pull your arm one way, the triceps will pull your arm the other way. Okay? They can either contract or relax. They can't pull in two different directions. So a muscle contracting leads to that pulling force where it's shortened, and when the muscle relaxes, it lengthens and no work has been done. It's passive, it's resting. So they need to have a partner, one to do one pull motion, one to do the other pull motion. And we have our ribs, our intercostal muscles within our ribs to do that as well. When we inhale, our diaphragm contracts and moves down. Our ribs relax and push up, right? So you try clenching your abs, they move inwards so that they won't help to increase the space in the thorax. When we breathe in, our external rib muscles must contract to shorten and pull the ribs closer and move outwards. Now, because our internal rib muscle must relax to go with the movement of that. So when we exhale, though, our diaphragm is relaxing, it's moving upwards and our ribs contract, move downwards and inwards and push the organs upwards, making that space smaller. So our external intercostals actually relax and our internal intercostals contract and pull back inside together. I would recommend going through this really slowly and looking at each step and visualizing what each muscle is doing and don't forget to breathe. So obviously our intake of oxygen is absolutely vital for continuing function of every single cell. So our respiratory system is in incredibly finely tuned, but the more finely tuned it is, the more things can go wrong with it, right? We have obstructions, we have um, you know, blocking the passages, we have smooth muscle that's tightening around the trachea due to maybe allergens. We've got the alveoli space filling it with water or mucus or whatever. Um, and our lungs can also be punctured. Now, lung cancer is extremely common. And just like any other cancer, it can be caused by chemicals or radiation, or whatever it is, right? Now, smoking uh, causes most cases due to the mutagenic chemicals in cigarettes. And there's also concerns um, around e-cigarettes and vaping and things like that. So passive smoking or inhaling secondhand smoke also accounts for most, you know, for some of these cases, as does air pollution. And some lung cancers can be caused by asbestos and silica, which are tiny little particles and dust 
uh, from construction and these you know uh, are sometimes incredibly difficult to treat so lung cancer can also metastasize uh, which means because there's a bloodstream running really close by anything growing in the lungs can really quickly hitch a ride and circulate around the body Emphysema is the most common or is most commonly caused by smoking and it causes the alveoli to lose their little bunch of grapes appearance and become more enlarged and really thick walled. So this means fewer tiny sacs, more large chambers, and that means lower surface area for gas exchange. So patients um, usually end up with shortness of breath, low oxygen, high CO2 levels in their blood, so less energy. And this damage is irreversible, sorry. Um, it's chronic and it will stay with you forever. Don't smoke.